Okay, so in this next presentation, we're going to continually discuss uh, Java FX, which is the GUI framework we've selected to talk about Unit 4, which is strategies and tactics for UI management, user interface uh, concerns for our software. And so one reason why we had selected Java FX is because it uses a contemporary or modern approach for organizing the layout of our code versus our application logic. So in Swing, our application logic and the layout of our graphic user interface is all done in a heavily object-oriented approach. But in modern interface design, we typically want to use a markup language to express the layout of the content that's to be presented. And then we have some separate code base that then controls the application logic that will then map to the uh, views. So here, one powerful thing about Java FX is that it supports what's called FXML which is a markup language that's similar to HTML. We'll, we'll look at that when we hit the introduction. So a quick overview of this presentation. We'll introduce what FXML is. We'll give some example code inside of Java FX. We will load a FXML file. We will import the classes from that FXML file. We'll create some objects in FXML. We'll look at the properties in FXML. We'll talk about what an FXML namespace is but the element IDs are so that we can access them inside of our Java code to like mutate them or to set them or to get values from them or to utilize them in our application logic. We will talk about event handlers in FXML as opposed to in just Java code. We will look at CSS styling, which will allow us to, to, uh, to provide styles, styling to the layout that we define to our FXML file. And then finally, we'll look at the controller classes. So yeah, this is a, it's just, it gives a whole new alternate approach to defining our layout objects and our node effectively defining our graph scene. Because uh, we can represent each node in our markup language. So quick introduction, Java FX, the FXML is a XML format. So if we haven't covered what XML actually stands for, it's extensible markup language. So any markup language is one where we can embed metadata alongside the content, alongside the data that our file has. So for instance, our file data, so for instance, in the instance of HTML, which is hypertext markup language that represents a web page. So a web page has the content that's intended to be viewed by the end user. And then it has metadata on how that content should be laid out. Like whether that should be a heading element, whether that should be a paragraph element, whether it should be set up as a collection of list items, whether it should be a hyperlink that allows you to move from one HTML page to another, all of that is metadata that relates to the actual content that is uh, shown to the end user. And so we can embed the metadata alongside the actual data in the same file. And we do that using the markup language approach where the metadata is encapsulated inside of the angle brackets and the actual content is defined in between the opening and closing tag. So we'll look at examples of this in a moment, but anything that's a markup language is pretty persistent in that kind of metaphor of how you distinguish the metadata versus the actual data. And it's typically using uh, opening and closing tags. And then your actual data can go between the tags and your metadata is what the tag names are. It's the actual tags that you're, you're inserting. Anyway, so Java FX, uh, Java FX's FXML is, uses extensible markup language. So extensible markup language is essentially what anything that uses this kind of tag metaphor. So HTML is a subset of XML. Now, the nice thing about XML is it's extensible. So we, it allows us to define our own tags. 
Whereas HTML is a closed system. You can't create new HTML tags. You have to work with the ones that are predefined. So that's really what the extensible means in XML. Anyway, FXML is a subset of XML, just like HTML is a subset of XML. And so you use HTML to compose your web GUIs, we'll use FXML to compose our Java FX GUIs. So FXML enables you to separate your Java FX layout code from the rest of your application code. And so what this does is it cleans up both your layout code and the rest of your application code base, which is a good thing. Uh, this is what we strive for is a separation of responsibility. We try to do that at the method level. We try to do that at the class level. We try to do that at the package level. And we're even going to try to do that at the application level where we distinguish the concerns that is the model versus the control, the concerns that are the layout, which is going to produce our views and then our sets of inputs, our, our sets of controllers. And so just one additional note is that the FXML can be used both to compose the layout of our whole application, or we could just do a part of the application GUI. So it just has a, a part of the layout in such as a form or a tab or a dialogue or something like that. So one powerful thing about JavaFX is that it allows us to mix and match however we desire. So we can have an FXML document that has like the initial layout and then if you want to use an object-oriented approach to customize what happens in your JavaFX application, you can do that as well. Okay, so let's look at a quick JavaFX ML example. So the best way to learn, right, is to look at example codes. So below here is just a simple uh, code that, uh, that composes a GUI. So this example defines a vertical box. And of course, we that class is called the box inside of JavaFX, containing a single label as a child element. The VBox component is a JavaFX layout component, right? So we always need a layout component whenever we define our scenes. So the label contains a text. So the layout component supports children. So we'll have the children nodes and inside the, the set of children nodes to our layout element VBox, we will give a label uh, element and a label element when the attributes a label element can have is text to display and you can, you can define that as string. So we've already seen this as Java code. So here we're doing effectively the setup of a vertical box and adding a label with some text into it the same way, uh, but using FXML. So the first line of our FXML is actually gonna be pretty much the standard first line of any XML document where you define. So again, this is, uh, there are some tags that don't need a closing tag. So like the, this declarative tag to state that this is an XML document. So any XML parser, so JavaFX as an application is also a FXML parser. So the first line is when we feed this, when we load this into Java as an FXML file, this lets it know, hey, this is an XML document. And it, then what you can also insert into these tags, into these uh, elements, these FXML elements. So again, anything in these angle brackets is the metadata. So this is letting the parser know what version number we're using of XML. So we'll just use version one and what the encoding type is of the content. And, and so the content, because recall that XML documents support data, and so the data will be encoded in UTF-8 in addition to the metadata, which is the content defined inside of my tags. So then my second line and my, my uh, third line here are going to be import statements. So the importing of these classes so that we can construct, so that we can actually instantiate them inside of our Java runtime environment. So in, if we want to access our constructors, just like in Java code, we have to import those class definitions before we can build them. Well, XML, this FXML is just another way of implementing 
the setup of our stage and our scene, right? But it's doing it in a slightly different uh, encoding style, a different format. It's using markup instead of Java code. But we still need to import the Java code to instantiate these into our runtime environment. So we need import statements. And notice these import statements look very similar to the way we would do this inside of Java. So we would give the package and the class names. And so once we import these into our XML document, we have access to these class definitions the same way we would in a Java document. But what's beautiful about this is it creates a uh, the same kind of hierarchical structure, the same kind of tree-like structure using tags that we would be used to if we are familiar with HTML development. And so I'd advocate, even if you're not familiar with HTML development, you get used to this, you get used to uh, defining your layout of your GUI using markup language because that's, that's the default. That's how we design our graphic user interfaces in today's age, right? Even things like React, if you've heard of uh, uh, React or Vue, which are these frameworks that generate uh, user interfaces for web applications, what they try to do is uh, embed the concept of markup language inside of the programming language of something like Java script. So this is something, so if you want to leverage your application GUI knowledges to web applications as well, it's a good reason to get familiar with encoding your layout design like this. Anyway, so what we can see here is that our first, the root of our node in our scene is the V box, the vertical box. And so we have an open tag and a closed tag. And the reason why we have opening and closed tags is these can have children, right? These can have nested elements. So this is just all like the setup stuff. What XML version are we using? What are, things do we need to import to actually start building out our scene? But now that we've imported everything, now we're gonna start using open and closed tags. And open and closed tags are used when you can have nested, this concept of something nested into something else. So remember some nodes support children, all the layout components support children's. So those are the internal elements that are part of that layout. So the box starts here and ends here. So it has scoping. So the open, so the open tag represents the starting scope of our V box and the closed tag looks just like the open tag, but it uses as a slash, right? So it's slash and then whatever the name is, is the, the end of scope of V box. So inside of V box, we'll say, oh, you have children nodes. So we're gonna open the children node and close the children node here. And then the child node that we want our V box to have is gonna be a label. Now the label doesn't have any internal children. So we don't have to give it a, a closed tag. We just have to define that we wanna have that label element inside of our vertical box uh, component. And so when we wanna define an attribute, so those properties that each node has can be defined inside of the opening tag. So since label doesn't have any children, it doesn't need a closing tag. It can just have the open tag. It, so it has an open close tag at the same time. So notice we have this slash that represents we're closing the scope of this the same time we're opening it. So this is an instance where we only need one tag because it's an open close tag. Whereas this is an instance where we have separate tags to open and close because we want to define children inside of it. Is this clear? Does everyone kind of understand and so this is doing the same thing that we've done in, in previous lectures, where we're defining a vertical box and inside the vertical box, we're uh, adding the label into it. And then that's being set to our scene, which is then set into our stage, all in one easy, like very readable format. So you can just look at this. The nice thing about this is when you learn to read XML, you can just look at this. It's very easy to type up and then you don't have to go through all the uh, rigmarole of having to set up everything in an object-oriented way inside your start method. Okay, so once we have the XML file, what does that actually look like if we want to go ahead and load it 
into our uh, uh, JavaFX application. So in order to load an, an FXML file and actually create that those GUI components that are defined in there, then we have to use the FXML loader class. And so that's going to be defined inside of JavaFX as a FXML package. Inside the FXML package is this FXML loader class. So here is a full JavaFX L, uh, here's a full example of our logic for how we uh, how we load the um, our example up. Okay. So here's the uh, full example of our Java FX ML uh, loading uh, logic, where we uh, load the FXML file, and we're going to return back. So we're going to so what it means to load a file is we're going to send the file, we're going to use the FXML loader instance. We're going to pass it in a parameter of where our XML, our FXML file is at. It's going to parse the metadata load and do the instructions that the metadata tells it to do. And then it's going to build out from there the GUI components that we've defined inside of the FXML file. Okay, so that's the general idea of how this is going to work. So let's like just run through this logic. We're going to import the application package. So we're going to import the application class from the application package because recall every JavaFX uh, application has to go ahead and create a concrete class from the abstract class of application. We're going to go ahead and import the FXML loader class from the FXML package because we want to try to actually load an XML file, an FXML file. Here, I'm going to go ahead and uh, define a scene class. Here, I'm going to go ahead and define, or I'm sorry, not define, I'm going to import my scene class so I can actually build up my scene. Here, I'm going to import my, uh, from the layout package, a vertical box so we can actually create an instance of that vertical box. Here, we're going to import our stage so that we can actually have a stage, right? All the things we need to construct for our JavaFX uh, windowed application. And finally, from the net package, we're going to, just for this example, we're going to import a URL, which will allow us to define effectively a path to access that XML file, that FXML file. So the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to define my actual uh, class, FXML example that's going to extend my application my abstract uh my uh, abstract class that the fxml application is going to require i'm going to define a main method in here that just you know it, if i don't define that here there's there's the implicit invocation but it's always best to be explicit and so inside my main method i'll just invoke the javafx's launch method and then I'm going to override the abstract method, the start method. We always need that start method because when launch occurs, it's going to, uh, JavaFX is going to create an initial stage and then feed that to the start method and invoke our start method. Inside of our start method, we're going to uh, create a new instance of an FXML loader. So we're going to call that constructor and we're going to save that loader into, um, into a local variable. Then we have to tell that loader, now that we've created an empty FXML loader, we need to set a location by which it's going to load an XML file from, and I'm sorry, an FXML file from. And so it's going to require a path to where that uh, XML file is located at. So since FXML files, much like hypertext markup uh, language files, just like HTML files, can be either on your local system or on some remote system, like on a web server, we can define a path using a URL. So a URL is just another way of expressing a file path, but it's one that is more expressive than the fact that it doesn't just define the file path on our local system, but we could define a file path that can even work on the internet if we wanted to, like across, across a network. So here we're, we'll create, we'll use the URL constructor and pass in a string that represents the relative path, right? I'm using the dot slash operator. So I'm just gonna give the relative path the same way I would if it were a path object. 
just to create a URL object. And I'm going to pass that to the set location method so we can tell our FXML loader instance where to go to find this FXML file. And so that'll just be a normal FXML file, like it's just enough, a file that has the extension FXML and then the encoding we saw before. Okay, so then once we do that, the loader is then going to be able to parse the document and it's going to then be able to, uh, to uh, load those GUI components. It actually build them in Java. Um, yeah, and so on loader, we can then do dot and then we'll use the same kind of syntax we use in XML to actually uh, uh, access some of the loaded content. So here our root GUI component is the VBox. So we're going to call the load method on the VBox. So again, this is this is effectively um, generic typing of sorts, right? So we're we're using the same thing put inside the curly braces. So what we've been using as our uh, parameter types whenever we've been talking about generics is effectively the same kind of form that we use to define our XML elements, right? So we're going to load the VBox element, the load method on loader, but in particular, we're going to pass in the root element in our, uh, in our generic parameter types. And then we're going to be able to save that as a vertical box, as our layout component, a variable inside of our start method. And we're going to pass that uh, layout element into our scene. We'll create a new scene and then we'll set our scene onto the stage. And then we'll show. Remember, nothing happens until we call the show method. And so this is an example of how we can take the XML that we've uh, that we've um, that we've created and actually load that into our Java FX application without having to manually set all that up. Let's see here. So I have a few questions. Uh, up to this point. So what's the difference between XML serialization and regular Java serialization? Well, that's a great question. So as you've probably noticed, uh, there are two examples of ways that you can serialize data. And whenever we talk about ways of serializing data, what we're really talking about is taking the in-memory uh, data of our application and so our data can exist either in the form of primitive data types or as reference data types. And we can encode them at a per byte level. So at a byte level, the, uh, the state of our Java applications or uh, the state of our data so that when our application stops, it can be persisted inside that file. And then when we reload our application, when we launch it again, we can read that file and uh, recall the prior state by converting it from the binary file back into those either primitive data types or back into those reference data types. So notice there's, there's two ways we can do this. When Java 1 first came out, we talked about how it supported various forms of input streams and output streams where the input stream into an application would allow us to take data from some other source we didn't care what the source was. It could be a network, it could be another application, it could be a file, or we could take a stream and send it out of our application to some other target, to some other destination. And again, we don't care what that destination is. It could be, uh, it could be a file, it could be uh, across the network, right? And so there were three types of streams that are defined in Java. You have byte streams, and then on top of byte streams, we could create character streams, which is supports text uh, natively on that stream. And we have object streams, which are built on top of byte streams, which supports object mapping uh, natively, like the ability to encode and, uh, and recall or deserialize uh, object code natively. Now, the big thing about the Java serialization is we don't really care what the source is, right? So we, if we're using an object stream, we're like, oh, this is a this stream of data is object based, so I can either read it as ints or doubles, 
or strings or as an object type. And then if it's an object type and I want to actually subclass it to what the object actually is, I can then cast it into what it is, right? So we've seen examples of the Java serialization. We didn't take too much examples of the Java XML serialization, but the, the XML serialization is a little bit different because it's more uh, articulated in terms of what the destination or what the source is, right? So, so XML is implicit of, uh, of something like a file or something of a format. So the encoding format's different. So the object stream innately knows how to encode and decode things in the stream, uh, the, the entities in the stream as Java objects, whereas the XML is a formatting instruction. So typically it's a file that has that metadata and that data associated with it. So it's just another way of defining how our data gets persisted and archived when our application isn't running or to be able to exchange that information from one application to another, right? So, so Java serialization is built in and we don't need to know any of the way that it's encoded. What's cool about XML is it's human readable, right? Java serialization isn't human readable. With XML serialization, we can use a generator, right? To create the XML specifications that preserve our data using the metadata, using those tags, using those markup tags, but we can also handcraft that. So I could create a file, I can give it the extension of XML, right? Or I'm sorry, yeah, XML, it, because we can use that even outside of JavaFX. This, this is a question outside of JavaFX, but we can, we can even um, go ahead and uh, create our own XML document. We can create the necessary uh, tags we need, and then we can, we can define how those get encoded as an object. Does that help express, answer that uh, first question about what's the difference between XML serialization, regular uh, Java serialization? Then in terms of uh, another question that I have that I see inside of the uh, chat is with Java FX, is it possible to create effects like when someone gets a good score on a quiz or something and there's confetti flying around or is it something else used? No, Java FX supports things like transitions and you can set up event listeners so that when there's a change that occurs or if there's a certain value that hits, then yeah, you can cause like uh, graphical components such as confetti to act as an event listener in that regard. And then you can go ahead and encode that. Um, we'll look at other ways. We'll look at the actual nodes that are available to us in terms of things like uh, images or text or the various inputs or shapes, being able to draw shapes and whatnot. Because you can produce both 2D and 3D uh, graphics using JavaFX. So yeah, JavaFX is actually powerful enough to be used as the basis of a game engine to kind of widen your horizons of how powerful this uh, graphic user interface framework is, is that it can only do the same things you'd expect a web application to do, but you could actually build game engines around it. And there are, there are. So I, as you start to learn this platform, I would, you know, implore you to check out uh, uh, some of the, 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 the game frameworks that are built around it. Okay, so I think we covered this here. This uh, did a full explanation of this code and answered some questions related to it. Is there any questions about the code or does everyone feel pretty confident with what I just explained between the XML side here and uh, the Java portion that then loads the XML and then constructs our scene and stage from that? Okay, well, I'm going to continue to move on then, and we're going to pretty much specify what we've already highlighted uh, or what we've already mentioned, but we're going to highlight it in these next couple of slides. So we talked about importing classes in FXML. So again, in order to use a Java class in FXML, whether a Java FX GUI component or a regular Java class, the class has to be imported into FXML the same way we would do it in a Java file, because effectively the, the XML file is going to get loaded by that FXML loader. And so it needs to know what imports it's going to do as it starts to construct out the layout of your GUI components. So here, 
FXML import statements look like this, right? It's just a single uh, tag. Uh, in the beginning, notice it uses this question mark import. Well, hang on, not that. Okay. Pretty much we open up these tags with an angle question mark, and we are going to end these tags here with a question mark and then uh, uh, angle bracket. So notice those are going to be different than the other tags. So going back to the XML document itself, these kind of header tags that we have, these, these, uh, these initial uh, heading tags are going to be the ones with the question marks, whereas the ones that are going to actually define the layout elements, the ones that are actually doing the construction of the GUI components, don't have any of those question marks. So if you want to think of this in like a Java way, you could think of this is the stuff that happens before you define your class. Anyway, so then we, and then the import's done very much like it is done in Java. Okay, let's talk about creating objects in FXML. So FXML can create both the Java FX GUI objects as well as non Java FX objects, what, or what we can also usually call POJOs, uh, plain old, uh, uh, what is it, plain ordinary Java objects. So another common term in industry is for these are POJOs plain ordinary Java objects. So these are several ways to create, so there are several ways to create objects in FXML. In the following sections, we will see what these options are. So we're gonna look at using uh, FXML elements that have no argument constructors. We'll look at creating objects using the value of method, and then we'll look at creating objects using factory methods. Factory methods are very powerful methods, usually static methods of a class that you can invoke that will create an instance of that class for you. Or it could be an entirely different class. It could be a class that contains factory methods. But the idea behind a factory method is instead of you invoking the constructor um, on its own, like using the new keyword, there's a method that understands all the dependencies that an instance might have, and it takes care of the dependency management and all the logic that goes into creating new instance for you so that you can just worry about asking that method to give you a new instance. Very common to have factory methods in uh, frameworks across all languages. So it's a good design uh, pattern for you to understand is the factory pattern. Okay, so let's talk about that first way, creating objects uh, using FXML elements and using uh, that, that have no argument constructors. So the easiest way to create objects in FXML is via an FXML element in a FXML file. The elements names used in FXML are the same names as the Java class names without the package names. So once you've imported a class via an FXML import statement, you can use its name as an FXML element name. In the following example, the element names vbox and label are valid because these two classes are declared with import statements earlier in the FXML file. That's why we did those imports. And here, let me do this. I don't just, okay, there we go. So we have all of our, uh, we, First line is declaring what form of XML we're using. Second and the third lines are going to be those imports. Okay, so in the, in the following example code, the VBox and label are valid because the two classes are declared with import statements. And so for the explanation thereafter, which is here, that this is what's defining the layout of our scene. And so we start always with a root node, which is going to be like a layout component, and then we can have all of our children components inside of there, our children node, our element nodes. So to create objects using the FXML elements like this requires that the class of the created object has a no argument constructor. So a no argument constructor means a default constructor. So we can only do this if the constructor of these elements uh, don't have parameters in the constructor. Because what uh, what uh, Java does when it sees this is it tries to create the VBox by just calling its default constructor. And same thing with the label here. Let's see. Let's look at an alternate way of creating objects. We could also use the value of method. So another way to create objects in uh, FXML is 
uh, to call a static value of method in the class you want to create the object of. So the, the way to create objects via a value of method is to insert a value attribute in the fxml element. So let's take a look at this example. Here I have my XML. And then here I have my import. So suppose that I have uh, this my class in this file path. I'll import it into my FXML document. Then I'll be able to go ahead and then create the my class. So I have my element, my uh, uh, FXML element, right? So it's both an open and a closed tag because we have the closed tag here as part of the open tag. And here I'm going to have the value that I want to set up for it. And I'm going to put an attribute inside of the tag, uh, either the header tag if it supports children or just the one tag if it's, uh, if it's just an element, if it doesn't support children. So here I'll give whatever the value name is here, like the, the uh, variable name and the value I'm going to bind to it here. So here in the corresponding my class code for this to work, I would have a class definition. And uh, there we go. We'd have a class definition. We would have a static method in our class that will return an instance of my class. It uses, it has to have a value of method. And our value of method is going to pass in a string right because this is the value that's going to get passed in to this value to the value of when it goes to uh to build this and here what it's going to do is then return a new instance of this class by invoking the constructor and passing in the parameter that that constructor requires and so here you can see i also in addition to the static method in this class i will have an instance variable that is a string that is the name value, and it will be defaulted to null. Or if I want, I can just do that. That's the same thing. And then I will create a constructor that requires that parameter, and it takes whatever is locally passed in and then binds it to the instance variable. So really, the interesting thing here is, and let me highlight this so that when I share this, it's going to be that part right there. And so that is effectively being defined by this right here. So we could see in our, in our prior example, how label right, can have this value set where the value of it is text. Okay, let's see here going through, I think, Okay, let's talk about that third way, creating objects using the factory methods. So in a sense, a value of method is also a factory method that creates objects based on a string parameter, but you can also get the FXML loader to call other factory methods in addition to the value of method. So to call another factory method to create an object, you need to insert an fx colon factory attribute. So this is a special attribute inside of an, F an fxml tag that when the parser gets to, it knows, oh, this is an instruction to, F to uh, Java FX to, and then the instruction is to do something related to a factory method, then, we will then we'll define what the factory method is. So the value of fx colon factory attribute should be the name of the factory method to call. So here, let's look at an example of some XML. So again, our first line of XML just defines what is the, uh, what is the version of XML and what is the encoding of the document. The second is going to be whatever statements. And here, let me just go ahead and produce some spaces just to make this easier for us to humans to parse. And then here, I'm going to do an import statement where I'm going to actually import that class that I want to have access to in my FXML document. And then I'm going to go ahead and create an instance of this class, right? I'm going to define the class instance inside the FXML 
by using the class name inside of the, the um, brackets. And since it doesn't support children, it'll be both an open and closing uh, tag. And here I'm gonna do the attribute FX calling factory to illustrate, hey, we want to call have fx to call our factory method, and our factory method is going to be called instance. So, in order for this to work, the my class uh, class should look something like this. So, suppose we have a class that's called my class. Then we can have inside of there a static. Again, all these factory methods should be static methods defined inside the class. It's going to return an instance of my class because we're using this to produce instances. And then we can call this whatever we want. So it could be called the instance method. So that's how we're defining it here. And then in this instance, it just returns a new empty default constructor just as a sample. Okay, let's talk about properties in FXML. So some Java FX objects have properties. In fact, most of them do. You can set the values of properties in one of two ways. The first way is to use an XML attribute to set the property value. The second way is to use a nested XML element to set the property value. So let's see how we can set properties in FXML elements. So here we have our opening tag that defines, okay, this is the version of XML and this is the encoding of the content of the text. The second is going to be our import statements. Let me do. So here we're gonna import our uh, vertical box from our layout uh, package. And here we're gonna uh, import the label controller. So a label from the control package. So here I'm gonna create a vertical box and I'm going to define properties on it. So I said there were uh, two ways. The first way is to use an XML attribute to set the property value. So this is an example of how we can go ahead and use the uh, XML attributes. So the attributes go into the heading of a uh, of a tag, so the, the opening tag. So VBox has both an opening uh, tag and closing tag because it supports children elements. It can have nested elements. And so a property, a, a, uh, a attribute of a VBox, which in Java we would call a property, can be specified here. So the spacing property we want to set with a value of 20. So we give the property name, and then we can give the value we want to bind to that property name, and then we use an assignment mm -hmm. operator in between. Okay, so the example shows three property examples, right? So the VBox property, and then we have two nested children inside of VBox. So we have the, the label property here. I mean, I'm sorry, the label element here, and we're going to bind text the, to the text property and label. We will go ahead and assign the value of line one. And in this the second one for the next label component, it has a text property we will bind to it line to the string. Okay, so let's see here. The example shows three property examples. The first example is the spacing attribute in the VBox element. The value set in the spacing attribute is passed as a parameter to the set spacing method of the VBox object created based on the VBox element. The second example is the children element here, nested inside the VBox. Uh, box element. This element corresponds to the get children method of the VBox class. The elements nested inside the children element will be converted to JavaFX components that are added to the collection obtained from the get children method of the VBox object represented by the parent VBox element. And then the third example are the text attributes here of the two label elements nested inside the children, the values of the text attributes will be passed as parameters to the set text property of the label objects created by the label elements. So again, this is an easy way to see the hierarchical structure that gets built. So we have these text properties that are then set inside the label properties, which are then set inside this children collection, which are then defined inside of our vertical box, our VBox. So let's talk about property name matching. So FXML considers properties to be member variables that are accessed using getters and setters. Hence, whenever you use the property name as an attribute, 
such as spacing here, then JavaFX is going to expect that there is a get spacing and a set spacing. And so when it sees you're trying to set spacing, the property spacing, it's going to pass as this parameter a set spacing function. So you just have to make sure that, and again, you can look at the documentation or if you build out your own things and use them in, in uh, XML, that they have the setters and getters that they anticipate. As you can see from the example in the previous section, the property names of the JavaFX classes are matched to the attribute and element name. So if you remove any uh, get set in the property name or, or uh, convert first remaining character property name to lowercase. Thus, the getter method get children will first be reduced to children and then to children. Similarly, the setter method set text will be reduced to text and then text. Uh, this is effectively just talking about how we're mapping the XML definitions, the way we're defining this in XML versus how this is defined in children. So when we say children inside of our XML, what it's going to refer to is the get children method on VBox, or when we say text in XML, it's going to parse that into a set text method inside of uh, the label. Okay, let's talk about some default properties. A Java FX component can have a default property. That means that if a FXML element contains children, which are not nested inside a property element, then it is assumed that the children are belonging to the default property. So let us look at an example of the VBox class that does have a children property as its default property. This means that we can leave out the children element and the XML, the FXML parser will still be able to parse it and know where to add, like that children are being defined. So it's, so it's a way of, instead of explicitly defining that we have a children element. And so in our children collection on our VBox, we're gonna add these label objects. We can leave out children and implicitly understood that if we have uh, nested elements inside of VBox, that those nested elements belong in the children collection. And that because, because VBox is a parent node or implements a parent node. Thus the FXML on the left can be shortened to the FXML on the right. And all we're doing here, this is exactly the same, but just notice children can be uh, implicitly uh, left out. We don't have to explicitly state that there's a children node. So if we just have nested elements, then the default property of VBox is to know that since VBox implements the parent node class, the parent uh, interface, then a default property for its XML, any nested properties will go into the children collection, whether we explicitly state it or not. And it just, and arguably this makes it more readable, right? It's less lines of code or less lines of XML we have to author. So a quick explanation here is that the two labels elements are then assumed to belong to the default property of VBox, which is the children property. A default property is marked with the, uh, with the JavaFX annotation at default property. And then inside of the uh, parameters here, value equals, and then whatever the property name is. So where the value of the name of the property should be the default property. So for instance, in the example we're seeing here, if we did at default property, if we're defining our own JavaFX class that we want, we could mark uh, a default property like this, at default property, and then the value would be equal to children. So this declaration would make the children property the default property for that XML. Okay, let me quickly mention FXML namespaces as well. FXML has a namespace and you can set, you can set on the root element of your FXML files, the FXML namespaces needed for some FXML attributes like being able to access the ID attribute. So again, whenever you do FX colon and then like ID or factory, we're defining a namespace, the FX uh, namespace. So setting the FXML namespace on the root element of an FXML file looks like this. So suppose I have my opening tag. And again, let me just add some spaces here. And then suppose that I have some, uh, my import statement here from importing the VBox. And so if I want my VBox to be, the beginning, the root of the namespace so that I can access things like IDs, 
ID elements so I can access them inside of my um, inside of my Java code, then as one of the attributes, I can type in XMLNS. So this is short for XML namespace. The NS is for namespace. So here, that's an instruction to say to let the parser know, oh, we're going to start our namespace here. And then I'm going to do colon FX. So again, this is the way of defining my FX, my Java FX namespace. And then what I would do is I would then uh, uh, set as a string that value. So the FXML names plus here is declared by the attribute declaration right there, javafx.com slash FXML. Okay, let's talk about FXML uh, element IDs. You can assign IDs to FXML elements. These IDs can be used to reference the FXML elements elsewhere in the FXML file. So specifying an ID for FXML element is done by the ID attribute from the FXML namespace. Here is an example of specifying an ID for an XML element. So here, we have our normal code here. We're going to create our namespace. Remember, whenever we want to start accessing IDs across elements, and that's that's the idea of why we want to create the namespace. In our root element, we're going to define the namespace using this uh, key value pair, this attribute, and this value for that attribute. Then in the label, let's say we want to give that label an ID that that, that essentially, you could think of that as an ID as a variable name, right? So we're not only constructing an instance of this label, but we want to maybe dereference it by a name later on. Well, if we give as one of the attributes a FX ID attribute to it, now we've not only created a label instance, but we've also given it a variable name of label one. So now if we need to go and access label one so we can change, say, for instance, the text property of it, we can do that using its ID name. So notice the attribute declaration FX ID is label one in the label one element. The attribute declares the ID of that label element. Now this specific label element can be referenced based off of its ID elsewhere in our FXML document. So for instance, this ID can be used to reference the FXML element for, from the CSS, for instance, if we want to style this element, which would be another document uh, to be a .css file. And so here, I also want to just briefly mention event handlers in FXML. So it is possible to set event handlers on Java FX objects from inside the FXML file that defines the Java FX objects. You might prefer to set advanced event handlers from within your Java code, right? So typically we do event handlers there, but we could do remedial or easy ones in the XML. For simple event handlers, uh, we can look at the sample code just to see how that works. So in order to find an, L, uh, an event handler, you need to use a script element inside of your FXML script. So let's take a look at how we can actually define both our callback function and, uh, our, and, and bind that callback function onto a particular element. So here is my open uh, my, 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 decla my declaration of my XML file. Here are my imports. So I'm going to import VBox. I'm going to import button. I'm going to import label. Here, I'm going to create a VBox element. So an open close tag. I'm going to set my namespace so that I can actually define IDs onto these elements, right? And then access those IDs in other parts of my XML document. So it essentially gives, allows me to give each of these, uh, elements, these XML elements, a, a name, an ID name to dereference them. Here, I'll create a label element as a child element to VBox. I'm going to give it an ID of label one. I'm going to give it the text property of button not clicked. I'm going to also create a button element. I'm going to give my button element an ID, so a, an ID uh, alias of button one, so I can dereference it. I'm going to give it a text property of click me, and I'm going to bind an event handler on there. So, or an action listener on there. So on the action, we'll bind an action listener. And so here, the value of on action will be whatever the method is, whatever the function is, I want to trigger when this action occurs. So on the action of a button getting clicked, it's going to invoke this click method. 
And then what I can do is I can create a script tag that actually has logic, programming logic into it. And so my programming lo logic is gonna allow me to create a function. So notice inside of scripts, we can create these dangling functions, anonymous functions, where I'm going to give it the name of click. Well, I guess it's not so anonymous, but I get to define it outside of a class. And so here I'll be able to access label one. Well, label one is this ID and it has a set tag method. So I'm gonna be able to use my Java code inside a script that can do Java code effectively inside this code block. And I'm gonna, I'm going to set the value of button clicked. So this is an example of how we can do these event listeners, both set up a listener and then set up a, a, a handler. So a callback function all in just XML without ever touching a, a .java file. And so that it's also possible to do CSS styling embedded inside of our FXML files as well. So you can embed style elements just like so. So here I am declaring my XML version. Here I'm importing my classes. Here I'm defining my namespace on my root element, which is my VBox. Here I'm creating a button that has the text property click me and an on action event uh, with a click callback function. So just like what we saw before, but now if I also wanna, if I wanna style that button in a particular way, instead of having to use a CSS file, I can create a style element using the style tags. And so the style, style tags can have multiple properties that I can apply to the button. So I would apply these properties in a name value, a scheme where each of the names are going to be dash fx dash like padding for instance dash fx dash border dot dash width so these are all the different css uh, uh, um, uh, attributes that we can have and these are the values that we can set them to and we uh, delineate the name value with a uh, colon and so if you're familiar with css the styling in JavaFX looks very similar to the way that traditional CSS works. And there is, I think, in a future slide deck, a, um, a link I send to you so you can see all the different properties and your styling to be able to change. I also want to just briefly mention the FXML controller classes. You can set a controller class for an FXML document and F an FXML uh, controller class can bind the GUI component declared in the FXML file together, making the controller object act as a mediator. So there are two ways to set a controller for an FXML file. The first way is to set a controller to specify inside the FXML file. And the second way is to set an instance of the controller class on the FXML loader instance used to load the FXML document. Yeah, pretty close to being over. So if we wanna specify the controller class in FXML, it would look just like this. The controller class is specified in the root element of the FXML file using, again, this type of attribute here, we'll specify FX, FX col, uh, colon and then controller. And again, th this is just another way of defining when we want a, um, a controller to be added. So here, let's look at the code. This is my XML uh, declaration. Here are my imports of the classes I'm gonna use. Inside of my root class, I'm gonna create a namespace so I can start using these, uh, these attributes like ID or like controller. And then on the root, I'm also gonna set FX controller to then go to this, my FXML controller class or whatever class that I wanted to find to act as my mediator. And then I'd have the rest of my XML code in here. So quick explanation, notice that the FX controller attribute in the root element, the VBox element, uh, this attribute contains the name of the controller class An instance of this class is created within, at, when the FXML file is loaded. So for this to work, the controller class must have a no argument constructor. And again, the other way we can see this is that when we use the uh, FXML loader, to first create an instance of the controller class and set that to the instance of the F FXML. So here, suppose that this is my controlling class, I can create an instance of it. And then when I create my FXML loader, I can just set as the controller that instance of the class. 
We can also bind JavaFX components to the controller fields. So you can bind JavaFX components to the FXML file to fields in the controller class to bind a JavaFX component to the fields in the controller class. You need to give the FXML element for the JavaFX component a ID attribute which has the name of the controller field to bind to its value. So here's an example controller class. So suppose I have this class here, public class, my FXML controller. And so one of the internal properties of that class is going to be a label. And so here in my FXML with the label element bound, I would create my, uh, my uh, VBox. I will give it a namespace. So I'll make this the root, the namespace so that I can give this an ID here a label one and i can have tax so notice how the value of fx id attribute has the value of label one which is the same as the field name in the controller class which is to be set so this is what we mean by having a controller class and then binding the xml to our controller class so if we want to reference methods from the controller it's possible to reference methods to the controller instead of from the fxml file for instance you can bind the events of a java fx gui component to the methods of the controller. So here's an example of binding an event of a JavaFX component to a method in the controller. So here, if I have the VBox, here's my, my namespace. Here, I wanted to find a controller class inside of uh, my root here. And then here, I'm gonna have spacing of 20. Then I'm gonna define my children. I'm gonna give each one of these, these IDs. And then I can create an on action that's then going to bind to that method button clicked. That's just an, an, an idea of how we can then reference these methods to our controller. Excellent. So then what we would do inside of our um, actual controller in class, right? The example binds the on action event of the button, remember right here, on action event to a method, hashtag button clicked, so inside of our controller class, we would have all these imports, like we would import uh, the event uh, from the event package. We would import FXML from the FXML package, and we would import the label from the control. These are all the things that we're, we wanna use. So inside our, our controlling class, we would use the annotation FXML, that's what we're importing here, to illustrate, hey, this is being set, this, this uh, action is being set, the on action is being set here. So to actually define what that callback function is, is inside of my controlling function, I can create this method, public void button clicked. That's this method here, but we put a hashtag in front of it, but we're using the same method name, button clicked. It needs an event passed in. Remember any, uh, any action listener is always gonna pass in an event object as a parameter. And then we can define the logic system that I, that print button click there. So notice the at FXML annotation above the button click method, the annotation marks that the method is a target for binding inside of our, F our FXML document. So notice also that the name of the button click is referenced in the FXML file, and it's the, the method name with the hashtag in front of it. Finally, obtaining the controller instance from the FXML looks like this. So once the FXML loader instance is loaded, the FXML document, you can obtain a reference to the controller instance via the get controller method. So if we have a controller that's defined and we need access to it in our Java code, we can just do loader.getController and that'll give us whatever class is the controller in class that it might have callback functions predefined or labels or fields. So the idea here is we can encode data and code, in, uh, we can encode our fields and our functions inside of FXML or we could bind another class to interact with our FXML document. So we could do either, either are supported by JavaFX. That's the thing I wanna highlight in terms of how we can get an FXML document to work in congruency with, uh, with, our, um, with, our, um, uh, uh, with our Java code and with our JavaFX application. Let me just finish this section off with just one brief demo. So here, let me close this. Let me close, no, I don't wanna close this. Let me get rid of this, so I don't need that. So here, I just wanna get the FXML example to kind of highlight what we can do here. So here, FXML, 
Let me take a look at the FXML example. This is all the same code we were kind of looking at. And notice actually what we're loading here. So if I briefly look through this, I'm creating a concrete class that extends the application. I'm creating a main method that invokes the Java FX launch. Here, I'm overriding the start method, which takes in my uh, stage. Here, I'm gonna create a new FXML loader. I'm going to then create a new FXML controller and class. So this, again, I wanted to highlight how I can bind a controlling class, a Java class to my FXML document. So here you'll see that I have a class defined, my FXML controller. I'm gonna have a uh, value, default value. I'm gonna have the labels that I would have in my FXML document. Let's take a look at the FXML document which I have defined inside of, uh, where is that? Assets, so inside of assets, I have my FXML. Here is, uh, let me go back to my example, hello world.fxml. So that's this one right here. So inside of my FXML document, the first line I have here is my de declaration of what version I'm using and what my encoding is. Then I have my import, so I'm importing VBox, I'm importing label, and I'm importing button. Then I'm declaring my root node, so VBox, and I'm creating my namespace. So this roots the namespace, and then I'm gonna give this property spacing of 20. And in the children collection, I'm gonna add in two properties. Since I have the namespace, I can give ID. So this gives essentially variable names to this label. So I have a label one that I can then access. I have a label two that I can then access. And then I am going to create a button that has a label, an ID of button one, and an on action of hashtag button clicked. So in order for this to work inside of my FXML example, I'm going to uh, create a new instance of controller. I'm gonna set the value of my controller. So inside of my controller, I have a set value. So I'm gonna set the value of that to be new value. And I'm going to load my controlling class now into my loader before I go ahead and open up and parse the FXML document. Now I'm going to create a new file that is going to point to the file path, hello world F FXML. So I'm gonna save that as a file um, uh, variable. Then I'm going to get the URL of that file because the URL is the parameter that we need to set as the location to our FXML loader. Then on my loader, I'm gonna set location with that file, that URL object. Then I'm just gonna tell my loader to load and I'm just gonna use um, the diamond operator to be as my uh, parameter type. See, I don't have to necessarily declare what it is. I can just leave that generic, but I know for a fact what it's gonna to return to me is the VBox as the root of my, my, uh, of my um, XML document of my tree. Then I'm gonna get the controller from my XML loader and I'm going to print out the value from it. And I'm gonna print out the label one and label two, which is now defined in here. Like I have variables and I can update these labels and these labels are initially declared inside the XML document here. So I'm binding these IDs to these variables inside of this class and I'm binding this method invocation here to this method definition here, button clicked with this annotation at FXML. And again, I'll have the hashtag button click there. Excellent. And then what we'll do is we'll then add that VBox into the scene and show it. Let's actually run this so you can actually see what all this looks like in practice. We did a lot of talking, but I always like to show this off. Oh, do I need to? Actually, I need to do it from here. I got so excited to show it off that I didn't put it in my helper, my, my runner example. Okay, well, so we were here. So let me run this main. Let me import it into my runner class. Okay, so now let me run this. And here we can actually see this in practice. We're, we'll have Gradle build out our project and we will launch our Java uh, FX application. And so there it is, line one, line two, click me and notice the button clicks. 
that was defined inside that class is printing button clicked inside of our console. Excellent. Okay. There was a lot to cover in FXML. So thank you for your patience. I am done with this section. Took a little longer than I would have, uh, than I had intended. And I don't like stopping halfway through so I can have everything in one video. So thank you for being patient on this particular lecture. And everyone have a great weekend. <laughs>